We all know of yesterday's most famous pens like the Parker 51 and the Waterman 52. But in your opinion, what pens of today are going to be the vintage classics of the future? Loving the Q&As as usual and cheers from the UK. Well, cheers. Ah, we got all kinds of international questions today. Um, well, okay, I think this is a really great question and this is one that I'm really hoping we can pull out into a slice and promote and stuff like that because I, I think it's a really interesting question to think about and you can, I want to kind of frame it up and say like I'm not a pen historian expert. I know a little bit about the Parker 51 and the Waterman 52. I happen to have one of each right here that I can share with you. Um, but so much has changed from these pens when it was in their heyday that it's difficult to really say an exact one-for-one -one comparison with these particular ones. So I'll kind of frame it up and just give you some context into what I'm thinking about anyway. So um, the Parker 51, Waterman 52, I mean, these are examples. There's lots of other ones, Schaefer No Nonsense and the Pen for Men and, you know, all kinds of other things. The Balance, um, you know, Parker 75. There's all kinds of other iconic pens. Um, the Parker 51, I would say, is probably, I don't know if there's exact data out there, but it's, it's pretty much assumed that it's the most popular fountain pen of all time. Um, there's, they made millions of them and sold them like crazy. So they were definitely the pen of their day and uh, have kind of stood up as, you know, one of the, the most, you know, iconic vintage fountain pens to collect these days. Um, and you can find them at all kinds of pen shows. People love to restore them. Uh, they have a hooded nib, so really keeps the nib wet and writes really easily. It's a snap cap and pushes the post balance. It's just really a nice pen all around. Um, they also have a steel nib version uh, in the 21, but uh, this is a 51 right here. And then there's a Waterman 52, which is a more of a, you know, a little fancier pen, more of a dress pen as opposed to kind of like a little bit of an everyday pen. But um, this one is ebonite and it has a nice gold nib on it. Um, definitely has uh, some interesting things going on with it. A little bit larger. It's got a lever fill in here. And uh, this is uh, really kind of a sought after uh, material for this particular pen too. But both really solid writers um, have a great reputation, really kind of iconic for their brands. But Parker and Waterman back in the day were really kind of like the um, like the Ford and Chevy of their day back, uh, you know, they were American made, actually in America still, <laughs> neither of them are now, they're both in France, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not quite the same as it was back then, you know, it was, it was different. It was kind of like the smartphone of the day. You know, everybody had fountain pens because that was the best tool for communication at the time. Okay, there were typewriters and other things like that. You know, I'm talking like the, mm, you know, 40s, 50s, that kind of era. Uh, even like 20s, 30s, yeah, it was that early 1900s. That's where pens, fountain pens really had their heyday. Um, and then they were kind of ousted by the ballpoint pen. But, uh, you know, these brands were really kind of like the iconic brands. You know, I would throw Schaefer in there too as like a really kind of iconic brand. And uh, so it was it was much more common to have them. You know, any stationery store would have these pens in their, you know, their displays and stuff like that. And it was not uncommon to see these kind of everywhere, just like you see an iPhone today. It was like, oh yeah, you got your pen? Oh, it's a Parker 51. Yeah, of course. You know, it wasn't, people weren't thinking about it like, oh, that's going to be a completely iconic pen. You know, it was just a really popular pen for a variety of reasons. So, um, given the fact that that's just not the way things are today, I think it's tough to say like what's going to be the vintage classic. It's going to very much have to be with a lens through like our little fountain pen world, like realizing, especially in the U.S. here, that fountain pens in general are not amongst the general population. Like we are you know, probably no more than 1% of the population as fountain pen users, if that. Yeah, maybe that might be accurate. I don't know. There's no like hard, fast data on how many people are actually using fountain pens out there, but 1% would probably be uh, surprisingly high in my view uh, of Americans, at least, that are using these. I know elsewhere in the world, it's much, much more ubiquitous uh, fountain pens, but not so much in the US here. Um, part of that's it's not taught in schools and this availability is not so much. And anyway, um, that's not really the point of the question. The point here is like what pens being made today are at least going to be somewhat as iconic as these particular ones. So I think that, um, you know, as far as what might be an indicator of that, it's tough to say because I'm 
personally not that old, so I don't uh, have a great perspective on, you know, what things look like when you're experiencing them versus when they become classic, so to speak. There's definitely some things where you're like, a movie comes out or a song comes out and you're like, oh yeah, that's gonna be around for a long, long time. It's funny, this is a complete tangent, but this is Q&A and it's appropriate to do this in this setting. Um, but there's this, um, this TV show, it's one of these Netflix uh, specials that's called, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Like Beetle Bugs or something like that. Anyway, I'm botching the name of it. I've only seen it once. But basically, it's a kid's show that's an animated show where they basically theme every episode around Beatles songs, and they incorporate the Beatles music into it. And so, like, my kid's generation is being raised with the Beatles and are learning their songs in a whole different context. And my parents are like tripping out over this because my parents were teenagers when these songs came out. And so they're watching their grandkids learning these Beatles songs that are 50 years old. And it's just, it's completely wild because they remember when these songs were coming out, you know, they knew they were great songs, but they never envisioned that their grandkids would one day be watching these songs set to kids' TV shows. You know, so it's just interesting things like that. You never know what's gonna become a classic. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna at least try to say my two cents here. I think a strong indicator, I'm taking a really long time to get to my answer, aren't I? I think a strong indicator of what's gonna be classic is really what's popular right now. And not just like popular in terms of a fad, but I mean like, what's really got the goods and has good substantial reason for being popular and kind of stands out as being unique and universally appealing. So probably most of what I'm gonna say is not gonna be surprising to you at all if you're in the fountain pen world. Um, and it's gonna be very skewed, of course, to the things that I have experience with. There may be other brands out there and things like that that I'm not quite as aware of. Though usually if I'm aware of it, even if I don't sell it, I'm aware of generally how popular it is. You know, there's brands like Mont Blanc that are very popular worldwide that I don't sell, that I realize are popular. And the, you know, the Mont Blanc 149, yes, of course, would be in there somewhere in that mix. It's also at a level, a price point where I don't know if it would really be fitting with the Parker 51 kind of situation because this was kind of more like an everyman pen. Um, and so I'm trying to keep my perspective a little bit lower on that, but certainly there's pens like that that could kind of fit in there. Um, one that I would say for sure would fit in there would be the Lamy 2000. Uh, I think it's already a vintage classic because it's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Still very popular. The design has been tweaked a little bit, but not a ton from the way it was 50 years ago. So iconic pen for a very established brand that has a fantastic reputation. The pens hold up. And I think already they're pretty much a vintage classic. But I think, you know, years in the future, the Lamy 2000 will still be kind of revered as one of those classic pens. <coughs> Along with that, kind of sticking with Lamy, I think the Lamy Safari. You know, there's other pens like the All Star and now the Lux and things like that that definitely are fantastic pens, but the Safari really kind of stands out because of the colors and just the price point, the accessibility of it. And yes, I am showing you an orange one, which is a previous special edition that you can't get anymore. I really just wanted to <laughs> make you drool a little bit, but. Um, you know, this pen, again, kind of fits in there. It's even more on the affordable end, uh, but I think it's, it's, they sell probably millions of these pens every year worldwide. I don't sell millions, but I'm sure they're worldwide, they sell a ton of those pens, and I think that it's, it's, uh, they're everywhere. Um, other ones that I think would kind of fit into there, kind of sticking with the Lamy 2000 kind of range would be the Pilot Vanishing Point. I really think this pen, I mean, this is another one that stood the test of time. It originally came out as the Namiki Capless back in the 70s. Actually, it might have been earlier than that. I should probably know when that first started. I want to say 67. Does that sound right? You're going to let me know in the comments if I was right or not. I'm going to look it up as soon as q and is done. I'm going to be like, dang it! I was wrong, but I think it might be 67. I know they changed things. Okay, in the 70s, all right, my, my, my memory is dusting off a little bit. In the 70s, they changed them to be the modern version of it. So it used to be a faceted plastic body that was a little bit thinner, um, and that was the previous version. They changed it in the 70s to be the modern uh, metal version. Um, but it's been, that, it's been this way for the last decades. Um, so I think it's it's already kind of proven to be a classic, still a very popular pen. They have all kinds of different finishes now, different nib sizes and stuff, and uh, it's a very, very reputable pen. 
This one, I don't really know if it would consider to be kind of in that same league, but the Pilot Metropolitan definitely would fit in there. I would say if you're going to put the Lamy Safari in, why not put the Metro? Um, this one, Penn's only been out for a few years, but it's come out really, really strong. The price point is fantastic for this, at least in the US. I think they've priced it to be an iconic introductory level fountain pen, because um, the same pen sells as the Cocoon in Japan for the equivalent of like three times more than this. So they have priced it in the US to really put uh, Pilot on a lot of people's minds. And Pilot's got a lot of great kind of iconic pens, really fantastic ones in there. So those are some of the ones that I really feel would be good. The Falcon I would probably throw in there too. It's a little more niche, but it's also very popular and it's got it unique and it's got some cool things going on with it. So I would say that one I could easily throw in the mix as well. And then there's other ones that I think are worthy of a shout out, like Visconti as a brand. You know, it's definitely a little more niche, a smaller, much smaller manufacturer than Lamy and Pilot. Um, you know, I think Lamy and Pilot maybe are considered more at the scale that, at least relatively speaking, more at the scale that like Parker and Waterman were back in their heyday. Probably not quite to that scale, honestly. But uh, they're definitely more some more of the bigger elephants or gorillas in the room or whatever you want to call them. I don't know why I went to an animal analogy on that one, but. Uh, you know, Visconti is much smaller, much, much smaller company. They're more of a boutique company and they do a lot of limited editions and things like that. But I think, you know, pens like the Homo Sapiens could definitely kind of fit into that iconic uh, kind of thing. They haven't been around quite as long, but they're kind of like the flagship uh, model of the, the, uh, the brand. I think Noodlers will hold its place in history, not because like of the supreme quality of those pens because they are so affordable, but I think the disruptive technology of that flexible steel nib will stand the test of time to say, yep, that was a turning point in the fountain pen world. Because really, for those of you that have been in fountain pens for a while, before the Noodler's steel nib flex pens came out, your only option for flex pens was a Falcon or some vintage pens or some other like really expensive, you know, pens or something customized or something like that. So I think Noodler's brought flex pen to the masses. And now when you look on Instagram and things like that, you see flex pens everywhere. A lot of that's because of the awareness that you've seen that Noodler's could really be credited for. Um, and then some other, uh, another brand that, you know, is younger, but could stand the test of time would be Twisby. I know it's got a lot of excitement behind it and they've had some disruptive kind of design and lower price point things in their pens that have gotten a lot of people excited. You know, so the affordability and the design of that pen could stand up. I don't think it's gonna be quite Parker 51, Waterman 52 territory, but uh, I do think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with Twisby over the long haul um, because of the affordability and the kind of the uniqueness of some of those pens.